Hey people, it's Patrick. Today is year 2023, June 27th. Let's continue with Maya expressions. We're just going to cover two things. We're going to be able to take external values and feed it into our expressions. I've already kind of covered it in expressions four, but let's take another crack at it and see how that can help us. The other thing that I want to do is to set up another scenario where we can drive our sine and cosine on the same object uh, with scale. But let's talk about that later. So let's just go for the, the first one, feeding external values into our sine uh, expressions. So up till now, our expressions are kind of explicit numbers, isn't it? Uh, when we want to change the amplitude and I want to change the frequency or offset in time, we have always been keying in numbers. So let's see how we can read from channels. Once we're able to read from channels, what can we do? With these channels, we can set keyframes and then we can set other expressions on those channels. Let's go ahead and see how. Set up a cube, set our sine and cosine, set it on the vertical axis, which is Y. Control right click or expressions. So control right click, we get the exact same menu as here. Expressions and uh, over here will show the results of our expressions only if we turn on the show results. So make sure that you uh, in the graph editor, you turn on the show results. Over here, we have our translate Y already selected for us. That's because we activated the expressions editor with translate Y selected. So translate Y, again, we want to use translate Y as equals to, let's do our basic sign and frame. Okay, and uh, there's an offset, right? So offset plus frame and times the frequency of the frame. So let's just put 12. You know that's going to plus one, minus one, uh, fluctuating around the center zero, up one and minus one. So that's our standard sine wave. So when we hit create, uh, you would see something's wrong. So let's click on the script editor and take a look. So there's no dollar sign, I think dollar sign. Uh, it's not an offset, so this uh, is called the offset, but let's just offset it by zero. We're offset, offsetting it by zero. Didn't know what offset was. Uh, it was a variable, but we didn't precede it with the dollar sign. So click create and immediately we can see this. If I uh, hit A, right, I frame this up. What we want to do now is to control first. Uh, let's just let's just play it for a while to see that it's working. Good, so it's working. Uh, we we want to have some control over each of these. Okay, each of these. So what we're gonna do is uh, right put it as a float. Right, so that's the magnitude or amplitude. Right, amplitude. Okay, amplitude. It's equal to, we say we put float because it's a decimal number, uh, it's a single uh, decimal point number. So uh, we'll just leave it, leave it for now. Uh, if I hit edit, it will cause an error because my expression is, is incomplete. So I'm going to put a double slash here, which uh, demarcates a remark. So it will not try and to, uh, it will not try to execute this and this is perfectly legal. So uh, did it just say that it is still invalid? It's invalid after the edit. Uh, AMP is undeclared. Uh, why? Because over here we put an AMP. So what we're going to do is just put back one and then hit edit. It's valid. Okay. Uh, another thing that I found out, uh, if you have a graph editor here, there's like an expression, what you can do very, very quickly is to double click this and hey, you got your expression back. So, okay, so this is uh, a shortcut that I found by having itchy fingers and just trying everything, you know, double click and oh, the expression came out, which is very good. What we want to do now is to create some attribute. Okay, so like I said, uh, in expressions four, I, I did it, uh, but I didn't do a whole lot of explanation what I was doing. So uh, add attribute. So whatever this is that we see in our channel box uh, is quite standard, right? So what we want to do is to add whatever we want from these. So uh, these are the type of attributes. So you know that kind of translate is X, Y, Z, which is a vector uh, scale is also a vector, but visibility is on and off. So it's actually a Boolean 
uh, so it's zero or one. If you it's you want an, a whole number, it's an integer without decimal points. So over here, we want our frame offset. You can put a float; uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, for now, you can offset like two and a half frames. Uh, it's okay. So we'll call it uh, sine offset. Okay. Notice that I do upper caps and this is lower caps. Uh, in a while, you'll see what that is. So this one, the translate y is actually a single word, but uh, Maya, because of the upper caps and lower caps, uh, Maya actually places a, a space here. So it's easy to read sine cosine offset. So I've got to start everything with sine cosine. So uh, it reads properly here. So sine cosine offset with the float. There is a default value, which is zero when you start it or when you reset it. Some special circumstances you want to actually limit it. Uh, you can put a minimum and maximum. So I'm going to hit add remember our sin cause and offset uh, Maya actually plays because of the lowercase and uppercase Maya actually kind of displays them in the channel box as separate words but actually it's a single word next I want to do the sin same thing sine cosine and freq and then it's also uh, a decimal point value so that's a float I wanted to start with one as a default because a frequency of zero is I think it's just going to give you a flat uh, curve with no fluctuations in value. Hit add. When we add it, uh, by default, the value is one, right? This one by default, the value is zero. Next, we want to do the amplitude, sine cosine amplitude, AMP amplitude. And then it's also a floating point uh, number, which is a decimal number. Anything to multiply by zero would be zero. So we want to put the default as one as well. Add that. And you'll see that we have three custom attributes here. The question is whether we can rearrange them or edit them in any way. I don't know if it's true still, but uh, the only way to rearrange them here is to save your Maya file as a .ma, which is ASCII plain text, go into Notepad and rearrange them, and then open your file again. Okay, so that's pretty drastic, isn't it? You have to save it as a text file, open the text uh, in Notepad, Note Editor, and then uh, change the order. If you don't want to go through all that trouble, think properly. The order that you place them down uh, actually matters. Now that we have created it, we can select one of them. So edit. What we did before was add attribute. Then now you can edit attribute. So when you do edit attributes, you'll see our custom attributes being shown, not the default ones though. So those are not editable. When you click on that, you have the option to rename them, right? And this is the nice name, which is whatever Maya is showing you in the channel box. And then you can put them to be has minimum or has maximum. You have some flexibility here to, to rename them. So maybe uh, instead of reordering them, you could rename them here, I think. So now that we have these three components here, we're going to read them into this and substitute them into our formula. So then they can actually affect how this is going to go. We've already created a magnitude or the amplitude, right? MP is equals to this. We're in the same shape, right? So I can call PQ1. Something has changed. I think if you go down your list now, you can see that here these three are showing after we added it. It's not the nice name. It's the name that we had with the lowercase and uppercase, right? So we can do PQ1 dot. The magnitude is the sine cosine amp amplitude so sin cos amp and when you hit edit uh, it's a valid expression it's not complaining so it gives us uh, it returns us the name of the expression which is expression one next what we're going to do is to substitute that to read right amp okay so hit edit ah uh, sorry I that's Houdini, <laughs> the attribute sign for uh, attributes in Houdini. So hit that. Okay. If we take a look at our cube, right, so it's going to from zero, uh, negative one to one, right? So if we put it to zero, zero. So if I now set a keyframe from zero, to one at frame 10, uh, having my auto key turn on, you'll see it right from zero to one. Here, if I click on the graph, you will see zero to one, and it actually grows upwards 
you see that you have the flexibility and the result of uh, hooking it up this way. So here we leave it to the user to key frame or to drive it with another expression or to have a connection editor to connect it with another attribute. So instead of 10, I put it to the 30. And uh, when you play it, you'll see two or three oscillations before it reaches the full amplitude. And uh, you'll see that in the graph editor, it kind of reflects it. So if I change that, 50. Okay, so as I'm dragging it, that keyframe around, the green curve didn't update. So I'm hoping that when I release it, that doesn't update again. So to force it to to update, uh, somehow you hit edit, you'll see that the, you'll see both curves. So that's the input curve. You'll see that the input sign cause amp is also displayed here because the expression to evaluate is dependent on I pull this in so that's dependent on uh, this second curve which is our manual curve right so that's shown together for our convenience so if you're wondering how I kind of move my keyframe around after I've set them uh, what you can do is uh, aim target this you click it it's, it's just changing the current frame right so shift left click it's kind of a selection range. Shift, left click and drag. That's a selection range. So shift, right click, left click and click. That's a selection range of one frame. So shift, left click, click it. Okay, and middle mouse drag, and you'll begin to move your keyframe. So shift, middle mouse. So you could middle mouse here to scale your keyframes for any of the keyframes that's caught in between your ranges. Please take care when you scale your keys like that. The keyframes have a very high chance of falling into like frame 26.2 uh, into decimal frame because when, you, when you're scaling it like that, it falls. It doesn't fall exactly on uh, integer frame numbers. This uh, shift, left click and middle drag and then release, middle drag, release. So you can drag it to whatever you want. And you can also right click, uh, let's go to this frame, right click and delete your keyframes and they'll be gone. Okay, so I'm I'm going to undo that. I'm going to edit. Okay, so you'll see that the now it's a regular animation channel. I can click on that and in two frames, put it to zero, and then from here in six frames, put it back to full intensity again so right so that's intensity or amplitude for us right next and that's just kind of the first of three things that we can control right so the next would be the same thing right it's a so it's a frequency so Take note that this AMP, right, is only known inside this expression. I don't care what it's called uh, here. It's sine cosine amp. Here, it's kind of a, uh, a name that I can just refer to. But in all purpose of good and clear code, please, uh, I can call it F, I can call it A, but just give it a logical name so that, you know, months after you write this, you come back, you know exactly what it is. Okay, so p cube one dot sine cosine frequency, and then uh, over here we replace it with right, freak frequency. And then the next thing we want to do is float uh, offset is equals to sine cosine offset, and that's the name, which is the offset. And when you apply that, okay, nothing has changed. So now if I change the frequency to like five times faster, uh, you don't need to hit edit every time because it's been already been updated. Okay, so I, I didn't hit the edit button. Uh, when you click play, right, you'll see that the frequency has increased. Uh, even on the fly, while it is playing, if I change my frequency to 0.2, you can see that it's kind of immediately 
execute step. Right, 3, 13. Are you wondering uh, why when I change it to 5, it was so, f it was very fast, right? 5, very fast. And when I change it to 13, it looks to be slower. Let's look at what's happening in the graph. So let's, uh, for that to happen, for the graph to update, I think we have to do the edit button. So edit. So you see that 5, right? It's pretty fast. Pretty fast. And when you change to 13, what's happening? Uh, by right, right? The, the faster the frequency is, the the more dense the lines. So let's slowly approach 13. Why don't we? 6. Right? Why? Like, oh, something has happened, right? 7. 8. 9. That's a mystery. Uh, suddenly it becomes very huge. Suddenly it becomes very small. Uh, what's happening here? I think uh, what's happening is uh, each frame it's no longer able to it's kind of the curve the frequency has become so fast that we are only catching the peak of you know from one peak to the next like maybe 10 cycles has happened it is the principle of the strobing effect if you see uh, on film or on tv where you have fast rotating objects right helicopter rotors uh, bicycle spokes and, and spinning wheels, sometimes they seem to go backwards, right? Or sometimes they seem to stop at every frame on impossible angles. I thought it was just going to the right and then on the next frame it goes back. or And then in the next frame it goes this way and the next frame it goes, th you know, in, in, in a cycle it's just going different different ways. That's because it's moving so fast that, uh, you know, the if you have motion blur they'll be kind of smeared in in the direction of travel, but if you sometimes uh, cameras use high shutter speeds, and then for that, when the shutter opens up and captures the image, uh, you catch it at a a position because it's moving so fast. Right, it's going one round and come back to the same point. Sometimes it doesn't look like it it has moved at all. That is just because it's kind of in sync with the shutter. When the shutter opens and catches light the position of the rotor is exactly at that same place. And then you try to close, shutter opens again. The position of that rotor is maybe just going back in a little bit, but maybe it's traveled like two uh, cycles. Remember folks, whatever I'm describing, uh, it's happening at like kind of 100 times a second or maybe a few hundred times a second. So uh, I'm just slowing down and talking us through it so that we can imagine it. So, uh, what we want to do is to be very careful about these things because after I go to number six, there is a threshold where I cross it. It kind of don't really make sense. Even if I do 6.2, suddenly I'll see very, very, very different changes, right? 6.5, suddenly I'll see a lot. 6.8. Uh, if you want to change these number interactively, you you know that when we want to do change these, we have handles. Uh, but over here, customize attributes. We don't have handles. Uh, so what you want to do is to click on the channel and right middle button, drag. So when you middle button uh, in an empty space in a viewport, it goes into left arrow and right arrow. So you can, you can change the value by scrubbing it as long as you are selecting it. In doing that, uh, let's, can I update? Yeah, I think you might have to hit edit. 7.2, 7.6, date. Well, it seems like 7.8. It, it seems like the relationship is stable. 7.8.4, uh, right? So it just gets denser and denser, but you see that at some point, right? 8.8, it's still, at some point, it the pattern that we were expecting it changes, right? Like, why did it not capture the peak of these? That is because the peak went in between those frames, right? Frame, uh, this is frame 49. Right, uh, 
Right, so frame. You know that there's 33 and 34, but you know that the peak kind of happens in between the 33 and 34. So uh, it's just hard. It, it became harder and harder. So imagine these are slices of whatever the camera is capturing, right? So the camera is capturing frames uh, when we render or when we, when we take a physical camera goes out, it, uh, it's capturing X number of times per second, right? Uh, we know exactly in film it's 24 times uh, the shutter opens and closes and catches light in, in a second, 24 frames per second, right? So if something is moving faster than that 24 times, it's going to fall in between and we can't capture the exact uh, peak and the trough of of that wavelength, okay? So uh, this is also called aliasing. Aliasing is forcing a continuous signal into bits and slices of whatever medium we're using. When we're using a display, right, uh, whatever our eyes can see are far more sharper and we don't count in pixels, it's just analog to us. But we, when we force our image into our display, our display uses pixels and, you know, that's why we try and get everything smaller and smaller, ever increasingly higher detail to match the real thing, which is no pixels. Um, our smallest units are the amount of light sensitive cells in our eyes. This is in the molecular realm. Okay, so that, that's what we have to work with. It's same as audio waveforms, they're kind of 44.1K, which is 44,000 times sampling per second. Yes, so folks, uh, time to appreciate the technology that we, <laughs> we have right now. We take it for granted most of the time. But yes, these are things that we have to deal with to get a sensible value. If I actually want to see it in a sensible way when I play, then I'll have to get in a sensible value. Okay, so uh, this, uh, let's get back to kind of three or something and edit. Hmm, even so, two, one. Okay, so that's how we hook up things into our formula. So who's to tell us that we cannot fit this thing into another sine curve, right? So right now when it goes up, you see that it kind of multiplies it up by the amplitude. Imagine that was another sine curve. And that takes me to the next topic that I wanted to talk about, uh, combining curves. In that way, we, we will be combining two curves. I'm going to delete the animation. So it's an amplitude of one again. So then with this, if I bring in another expression for this, and I say that, uh, you know, it's cosine 23 plus frame times 1.2 times 1. So it's going to go in between neg negative 1 and positive 1, which is because it's going to be multiplied in our original, right? So I want to multiply between 0 and 1. So I'm going to times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. So if you've been following the rearranging video from Expressions 8, you will know what exactly I'm doing. I'm halving it to plus minus 0 0.5, and I'm adding it by half again. So it falls between 0 and one doing this i create right you will see this zero to one is whatever we've just keyed in here and that is going to go in to our translate y as a multiplication into this app and when we play that's not what i was actually looking for let's slow it down 0 0.5 edit mm, 0.1 i think the other one is a this cosine app, put it to 0. Point. Yeah, okay. So uh, because that sine wave is going much faster, the combination of these isn't very illustrative. I wanted to talk to you about, okay, so this is what I was looking for. You'll see that the this is our second cosine curve. The second cosine curves go much slower than the first one. And you'll see that uh, we, we understand that this is going to feed into the, the my actual this by multiplication, 0 to 1. I'm already going into that next combining uh, curves a little bit because these two curves are kind of combining themselves, right? So this thing actually stands for that big curve and then it's kind of multiplying itself. So when when it's going from 0 to 1, uh, that, uh, that second curve is not going to negative 1 to positive 1, it's going into actually 0, 0 to 1 now, right? So when it's multiplying, What's anything multiplied by 1? 
what's 800 might multiply by one it's 800 right what's 1600 multiplied by one it's 1600 what's two multiply is two so when it reaches one it's gonna retain its original value right what's anything multiplied by zero it's zero right so it's kind of going from the original value whatever it is and bringing it down in value to zero and then going up back to its original value so that's multiplication when you go and see the resulting curve you'll see that you know when you kind of multiply by uh yeah. i could put this back to it goes to one right so that's always gonna this is gonna evaluate and i'm gonna put it back to one hit edit and you'll see that oh that's the full power and the full value of whatever that original uh this sine curve was right but now if i now comment this out and hit edit you'll see that curve come into play and that curve is multiplying and then you'll see that it goes up in intensity and then it goes down and it goes up and it goes down so this kind of replaced my keyframe right so just now you see what that keyframe with the amplitude intensity was doing and now this one it's pretty much it's just making it stronger and weaker and stronger and weaker okay so uh, I've, I hope that this has kind of opened up doors of possibility I hope you're inspired you know like oh I can do I don't know I can do uh, jittering I can do shaking vibrations uh, at regular intervals or maybe not so regular intervals so I'll, I'll talk about more uh, than that uh, then multiply uh, you get add you can subtract uh, for compositors among you, for generalists among you, when you do shaders, when you do Photoshop, when you do nuke compositing, layering pixels, uh, when you understand this, this is exactly what is going on underneath when you do a layer multiply, layer add, layer subtract, okay? We are simply subtracting values from uh, what we're doing here is sine curves, uh, cosine curves, or even noise, but What's going on is when you multiply, you're multiplying, right? So remember, uh, so let me speak about to the compositors. If you're doing ambient occlusion, right? Zero to one, right? Your 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 image is grayscale, white color, and your image is one, right? Zero is black. So the white parts are going to be left alone because white, so anything times one, right? Is the original color. But when something multiplies by zero, it's going to bring the value of the color right down to zero. So that's why when you multiply stuff, only the bright parts remain as untouched, right? Because that's 1.0, so that's white. When you multiply anything by black, which is zero, you'll get shadows. Yeah, so that's just a teaser for you for the next time when we talk deeper about the other, like plus and minus. Let's go very quickly now. I think I've taken enough time from this video. So I'm gonna just save my file first. The common thing that I would like to do uh, for myself in my workflow, uh, when I'm doing Houdini stuff, I tend to start with H underscore. Now I'm doing Maya stuff, so I'm M underscore. <laughs> and then I, when I'm doing Nuke stuff, I do N underscore. Yeah, that's just my naming convention these days. We're going to do a scale that drives the amplitude of maybe a ball. Like when the thing is huge, right? When you scale it up, it's kind of vibrating uh, up and down. But uh, so the larger it is, the smaller it vibrates, maybe. And then the smaller it is, uh, the larger it jumps up and down. So what we're going to do is now to go to the sphere and let's do that expression again. So to save us some time, I'm going to copy over that expression. Copy, expression, I'm going to paste. And there's something I need to do with the pasting, right? Uh, this is looking to pcube, which is the original object, but uh, not going to do anything right now because over here in our sphere one, we don't have these attributes yet. So I'm going to leave it, but this pcube one's translate y will now be called p sphere one translate y. Hit create. So that's still reading off the attributes here. Uh, not to worry. Let's just create all these in the p sphere first. So I'm going to do the add attribute very quickly. Uh, sine, cosine, frequency, float, and frequency is 1 by default. Hit the next. Sine, cosine, offset. I think I've kind of swapped them around, but never mind. 
So offset zero, good. Sine, cosine, amplitude. And the amplitude is times one. So I want it to be one at the default. Okay, so uh, between these two, you can see that I've kind of messed up the order, but never mind. So now uh, in the Y, right, I can put P sphere one now to read off its own. That was copy and paste. So I copy one time, I can paste multiple times. What we want to do is X, Y, Z, we want it to always scale uniformly, right? So what I can do is to go to a connection editor. One attribute is driving another attribute. So I go to the scale, scale. So I want the scale X, X to be driving its own Y and Z. So when you do that, you'll see that the channels are yellow. So the yellow means kind of a direct connection. So there is no room for like times two, times five or offset or something. So it's just kind of straight, straight up connect. All right, so now when we execute the scale, what you can do is just to drag the handle and you can see the X and the Z following exactly. Or you can just middle click, middle, drag, middle mouse, drag. Okay, and it will drive. So in case you want an expression, you can just hook it up to one channel and then the other two will follow instead of having to kind of also drive the expression here, also drive the expression here, uh, which is redundant. Okay. Uh, let's say from 0 0.5, we, we want to arrange from 0 0.5 to 2. We want to look out for this guy. Okay, so this is our original expression. And what we want to do is to affect the amplitude first. By right, I wouldn't need to do this uh, to expose the amplitude because I can just kind of take the scale into consideration here. So flow scale is equals to p sphere one dot scale x okay so so scale i think it could be called scale x no nope. scale so to know what it's called you can click on so something went wrong so i can just comment it hit it okay it's not offensive anymore so scale x so you can copy this okay go back to translate y and just paste it so it looks like this, no problem here, right? Hit edit again. So script editor says there's a problem. Let's take a look. Uh, it's invalid after the edit. Why is that so? I think we, this one may be a problem, uh, some kind of a special name, right? So uh, scale result. Okay, hit edit. Uh, it's still invalid. Why? Uh, because I forget this. Okay, so you can call it scale again and hit edit. It's okay yeah, without the string sign or the dollar sign. Uh, it doesn't know whether it's a function, uh, it's a variable, or it's something else. Okay, so scale x. So now it's the range thing again, right? So the scale goes from zero. Uh, I want it to 0 0.05 to 0 02. So what we want to do is to take a clamp function. The clamp function will uh, clamp a curve. It will not let the value go below or above. Uh, that curve goes like that. This is zero, right? This is one. If I have a clamp from zero to one, my curve will go like that. Okay, so the resulting curve uh, will not go above. It will remain at 1 and it will not go below 0. So that's the clamp thing. So here, I, I want the scale to be clamped at, uh, from 0 0.5 to 1. So what I do is clamp hmm, my uh, expressions. Right, minimum, maximum, and parameter. So when we say clamp between zero and one, right? So the zero goes here and the one goes here and the fluctuating incoming value continuously is on the third one. Uh, in different applications, that's different. In Houdini, it's the 
incoming number first then the minimum then the maximum so that's why i have to check it out so uh do a clamp uh minimum maximum so minimum is 0 0.5 maximum is 2 and then this so you know that whatever incoming if it's lower than 5 it will give me 0 0.5 if it's larger than 2 3 100 1000 it will give me 2 if it goes uh it goes negative like negative 5 negative 500 it'll still give me 0 0.5 so that's how i can uh, control that value so hit edit so no errors detected which is good next uh we will that amplitude right uh let's feed it scale and see what happens okay scale so please take note that i i totally ignored this amp right so th this amp has nothing to do with but if i actually want still want to have this amp affect the final thing i can still times amp right so we know that with the multiply it doesn't really matter which one gets multiplied first but with the bracket we can say we can see that these two are kind of grouped together visually and it affects the final scale after our sine cosine this is still uh useful i can still have some user input here okay so hit edit uh, and what happens is uh i'm going to scale this down frame five scale is zero let's set from zero and then three edit button so you see the scale becomes larger but the clamps keeping it at two right and uh, before that let's move the keyframes a little bit from 10 to 20 26 so you see that before even more edit okay so you see that uh 0 0.5 so that's the clamp doing its job when the when the value it's zero right in the beginning the 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 value of the sphere was zero but it's still moving at 0 0.5 amplitude and then when it goes large it increases in amplitude okay so i just wanted to go bit below to zero to show you what's happening but uh no need to do that because with zero scale we can't see anything anymore so 0 0.5 Okay, so that's uh, 0 0.5 and then and then it goes up to scale 3 amplitude of our curve remains at 2 so now that is proportionately increased increasing that means it's doing kind of some kind of a low amplitude right 0 0.5 and then when uh, the scale goes up this also goes up to 2.0 now we want to reverse that that means when it's 0 0.5 i want this scale to be large when it's two, I want this to be small. How do we do that? So you know that the maximum is two, right? So I'm going to do two minus these. And that will give me a reversed. Can you see that? So uh, I can do this only when I know that uh, where the upper bound is. The upper bound is two, the largest value that it will go. So I take two minus. So when, when 0 0.5, right what happens with the minus is when two whatever was the lowest at 0 0.5 now i'm gonna minus so when two minus 0 0.5 it becomes 1.5 when two minus two it becomes zero before that we had we had 0 0.5 to two right so when we take two minus 0 0.5 we ended up with uh zero uh, 1.5 to zero right so this one is the so this resulted in this how do i get it back from to uh 2 to 0 0.5 all i need to do is add 0 0.5 okay so i, I i'm reverse engineering here so when 1.5 adds 0 0.5 we get 2 right 
So when 0 at 0 0.5, you get 0 0.5. So then I'll get the exact opposite of this and this. Okay, uh, I don't have a math major. I don't specialize in math, but uh, I'm just doing some hard coding here. 0 0.5 plus 2 minus. So that gets me the opposite. I, if you don't understand this, uh, don't worry, neither do I. I'm just kind of acting out of instinct, uh, <laughs> just trying to do the reverse of whatever I can get. So uh, I'm going to push this a little bit further and update the graph. So you will see that uh, after 50, you'll see the 0 0.5 mark. And before that, you'll see the 2.0 mark. So that went in reverse. So let's see how visually that looks. When it is small, you see that it's kind of largely agitated. And then when it went big, it becomes more stable and less disturbed, right? Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, I think that was fun. Uh, and if, you know, a lot of my stuff, uh, if you see my videos and, and all that, you. You tend to notice like, hey Patrick, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, there's no practical use for this, but uh, I think I'm just trying to show uh, that's what that's what's occupying my mind most of the time, and it's kind of useless stuff. But I think these are building blocks uh, when you face a real uh, an actual project and you need something, right? So the director needs something, the art direction needs something. Uh, of course, you can keyframe it manually, but again, the point of doing all this is so that we can... Uh, it's scalable. If I need 10 objects, I need 20 objects to behave slightly differently, you know that the, the expression, the formula is the same, right? And then we just put in different values. We don't need uh, lots and lots of animators to key it. Uh, of course, purists will say that nothing can beat your human handcrafted animation, and I do agree. But uh, math, uh, if it's not the hero object, it's not the hero character, uh, sometimes the secondary character, sometimes the secondary objects uh, that needs to fill up the background, mid-ground, or uh, even working on top of hand-keyed objects just to give it that extra character, that extra uh, reaction, right? Uh, anything that can help so uh, yeah so <laughs> don't worry uh, I, I don't think it will go to waste uh, it's just that you know uh, just use it smartly and use it correctly when the time comes you would be glad that you you've put some time in <laughs> you know to uh, into all these okay so uh, I'm gonna leave you with this uh, and uh, well if there's the when it comes to the next video we'll talk about <coughs> more about uh, curves working in conjunction, in combination with each other. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, if you really like this and you, if you kind of feel like you want to support me, please subscribe and uh, like the video, right? Uh, and I'll see you in the next video.